Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Representative Rena Moran of District 65A here in St. Paul. I just want to say that the challenges facing Black Minnesotans are numerous. They are persistent and urgent and have been greatly compounded by COVID-19 impacts on our, our health and our economic security. Today, we gather to announce the 2021 legislative agenda for the United Black Legislative Caucus with the goals of eliminating racial inequities and in helping Black Minnesotans bounce back from the COVID-19 pandemic. We also need to recognize today the significance of the size of this group. With this being Black History Month, I feel the need to note that I entered the House as a legislator in 2011. I was one of three Black lawmakers. Now there are 10 of us strong, given a strong voice to solution, ensuring that Black Minnesotans have a greater, stronger future. I'd like to introduce you to our new members of the UBLC. We have Representative Esther Abaje of Minneapolis. We have Senator Omar Fate of Minneapolis. We have Representative C uh, Cedric Frazier of New Hope, Representative Athena Ho Hollins of St. Paul, and Representative John Thompson of East St. Paul, along with myself, Representative Noor, Representative Ruth Richardson, and Representative Holden Hassan. Black Minnesotans deserve a bold progress towards eliminating disparities, rather than just the incremental changes that have been that that we have had over the course of so many years. This agenda represents action lawmakers can take this year to ensure everyone can share in our state success. I start off by, take, by, by talking about housing and the fact that Black Minnesotans have faced systemic racism and home ownership through redlining, displacement, and barriers to capital, in addition to facing discrimination as renters. The United Black Legislative Caucus supports pathways to home ownership programs a 60-day pause on eviction or floor closure action at the expiration of the peacetime emergency, a 50 million investment in emergency housing assistance through the peacetime emergency. We support sustainable rental assistance where qualified renters pay only 30% of their income to rent. Automatic expungement of eviction when a tenant has not been evicted by a judge and an establishment of a 14-day notice period before an eviction proceeding can start. We believe that our agenda will help ensure that everyone has a place to call home and children have an opportunity to focus on homework. Now I turn things over to my colleague, to my colleague, Representative Mahmoud Noor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Moran. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. As we underline uh, our commitments and ongoing work with regards to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Wealth and income inequality didn't just show up during COVID-19, but it's a systemic challenge. And let me say this, the system is working as designed. Black workers in Minnesota are overrepresented in economic sectors hardest hit by COVID-19 pandemic. And according to DEED, more than 67% of Black Minnesotans received at least one week of unemployment benefits. They're also on the front lines as essential workers. Wealth and income inequality will not, solve by, will not be solved by merely moving the chairs around the table. It's going to take sustained transformative investment. What we are showing up, ensuring that we can help our communities by designing legislation that will help us with that process. Some of our commitment in economic development is to ensure that we do have an equity and economic process that will help us. Number one, we wanna make sure that we do have capital 
for businesses to thrive beyond the COVID-19. We want to make sure that there's technical support that we can establish micro enterprises and micro funding for our communities. We also want to make sure that individuals can have an opportunity to have an upskill and have jobs for the future and ensure that we prepare the community to do a better job so that they can continue to work. We also want to change the systems that exist in place in our state to ensure there's a fairness in contracting process that we have to ensure that we streamline the process and ensure that there's 15 percent as it's right now in chapter 16. And also ensuring that our artists and organizations of BIPOC community can take advantage of the capital investment funding that we do. Going on to the transit system, what we're fighting for is a fairness and ensure that we are included in the process. We wanna make sure that we do have transit ambassadors that will also decriminalize the fair program we have. We also need to make sure that we have a comprehensive regional transit system and expand transit in our neighborhoods. Finally, we want to make sure that we do have cameras that are constitutionally allowable to ensure that we can provide significant support, not only to our law enforcement, but to our communities going forward. With that, I would like to turn over to Chair Richardson. Thank you, Chair Noor. Uh, good uh, morning, everyone. In 2020, the Minnesota House of Representatives passed House Resolution 1, declaring racism a public health crisis. It was a bipartisan resolution that acknowledged that systemic racism exists, that systemic racism is harmful, and that as a state, we need to work together to address the disparities that we continue to see um, in the health arena. These disparities are persistent, they are unacceptable, and they are in fact killing our communities. One of the primary areas that we are going to be focusing on this legislative session is addressing the unacceptable disparities that we continue to see in maternal and infant health outcomes within the Black community. Black women are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy, um, pregnancy during childbirth, and postpartum than white women. And to put those numbers another way, Black women are 243% more likely than white women to die of pregnancy-related or childbirth-related causes. Another really important startling fact, the majority of these deaths, 60% or more of them are preventable. There are things that we can do to end this unacceptable uh, disparity. And when the general public hears these stats, oftentimes they assume that Black women have higher risk of complications because of poverty or because of uh, education, but research proves that that assumption is incorrect. When you control for general health, for education, for income, and other factors, Black women are still more likely to suffer serious pregnancy complications and death. In fact, Black college educated mothers are more likely to suffer serious pregnancy complications compared with others who've never graduated high school. And to take it to another level, when we look at the infant uh, mortality uh, statistics, black infants are twice as likely as white infants to die before their first birthday. There's uh, emerging research coming out of the University of Minnesota with Dr. Rachel Hardiman that shows that uh, black uh, infants that have black doctors that mortality rate is cut almost in half. This tells us that there is something shockingly wrong within our medical system. And there are things that we can do to prevent uh, these deaths. I'm excited to be able to work along such a strong group of uh, within, within the United Black Caucus and to be united in our focus to address these startling uh, health disparities. There are things that we can do and we are committed to moving the needle on these disparities. I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, Vice Chair Hassan. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Horton Hassan, uh, representing District 62A of South Minneapolis. COVID-19 has taken a toll on our education system. It has worsened our opportunity gap and left many of our black students struggling like never before. The UVLC is presenting you um, the agenda for education this year. Um, there are two, two areas we're focusing. Number one, we're 
we want to make sure that um, we put money in the disruption of COVID-19. We know that um, when COVID-19 hit and students went into distance learning, many Black uh, students didn't have laptops, they didn't have access to internet, they didn't have safe place to uh, do distance learning. So uh, with House File 4, we will have a wraparound services where we invest money in after school programs, summer school program, math and reading programs, as well as full community service schools and trauma informed um, schools. And also, we also know that representation matters and students learn best when folks who understand their experience and can relate to them are teaching in their classrooms. That's why we're also pushing increasing Teachers of Color Act legislation. This legislation will increase uh, the preparation uh, and the retention of more teachers of color and American Indian teachers in our classroom. With that, I yield back to Chair Moran. Thank you. Thank you, um, members. <clears throat> and so with that, what I would like to do is one, acknowledge our Senator Bobby Champion that I forgot to mention in our uh, introductions of our Black Caucus. So I want to, you know, this is a bipartisan Black Caucus, Senate and, and House, um, where we stand collectively advocating for stronger and better outcomes for families and children across the state of Minnesota of Black descent. So with that, I would like to just open it up for questions. If anyone has questions, feel free to use the raise hand function or drop them into the chat. Uh, Mary LaHammer, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is a specific question to Senator Champion. I, I noted your floor speech earlier this week talking about the history of the first Black senator, and I think it was news to many people. You mentioned he's from St. Louis Park. I'm actually doing a large story on it. He's from my neighborhood that I grew up in. Can you talk about the, the kind of lack of awareness uh, of the history of representatives of color in both the House and Senate and that large gap of time between the House who had the first Black lawmaker in the 1800s and then it took to 1970s in the Senate? And that, could, could you talk about that historic difference? Yeah, so thank you so much for asking the question. I think globally, I, I would start here by saying one of the challenges is that so many, that so few people know of the many and the varied contributions of Black people and in and, and every uh, facet of life. Think about uh, when folks started learning more about the women who did the coding uh, in the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, think about just just the many different contributions. I don't need to go through them one by one, but whether it's in medicine or education and so on and so forth. And so one of the things that I really believe is important is that if we would intentionally make sure as a part of our schools and universities that there's an intentional inclusion of black history uh, because it is American history. And so I think that is an important place by which to start because I think it would also lead to better outcomes even when we think in terms of black and brown kids understanding that we've made so many contributions to this uh, country. And it would also uh, make sure the white kids would have a different appreciation because when you think in terms of we the people and the constitution, it talks about prosperity, which is means our children, our future, right? And so as it pertains specifically to politics, I highlighted Dr. Uh, Robert Lewis, who is from St. Louis Park from 1972, and most people don't know that he was a veterinarian and there's a building named after him on the University of Minnesota campus. Uh, and, and so it's a rich history. And most people would think that the first black senator came from North Minneapolis or some other place, but it was from St. Louis Park, right? And so to me, that's extraordinary. And the distance in 18, I believe, I, I believe it was 1899 or somewhere in the late 1800s is when uh, the first house member was elected. And, and, uh, uh, and that's interesting because there's no justification as to why you know, there was that lag in time. But what it also means, and uh, I like to say this, the reason why I'm a good Senator because I was house trained. <laughs> and so that helps for us to understand that even when you start things in the house and the house sets th that a uh, real important tone for uh, uh, pushing things forward. And so again, history is important. 
Black history is important. And we have to not just relegate that history to February, even though the whole reason why February was chosen wasn't because it was the shortest month. Well, it, it, it was because Abraham Lincoln's birthday and Frederick Douglass' birthday is in February. And black folks wanted to make sure that they were highlighting the important contributions of, 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 of our people. So I think it's important for us to continue to move forward. You can see also from this um, uh, gathering of folks that's here, we are continuing to push. And, and, and when you're at the table, then you're not on the menu. So we can put the issues that we believe to be important that would help all of Minnesota become a better Minnesota uh, and uh, because they will see us and they will see what we do as well. And so our issues are important as well. So thank you for the question. And I'm sorry if I took a little longer than anticipated. Can I jump in with a follow up because you mentioned education at the, at the collegiate and, you know, high school and below level. Can there be specific legislation to really encourage this? Is this something you're starting to see on its own? How, how much of a role can and should the legislature play? I think the legislature can play an intentional role in, in that, right? You know, when we think in terms of curriculum and um, pedagogy and just all the other things that are so important, history is important and we should say it should be a part of it as we do other things, right? Most folks come and talk about comprehensive sex education. Why would we not also say there should be comprehensive um, uh, American history, which includes black history. And so I think that uh, we are seeing it. We understand the importance of it. It raises esteem, it, it raises awareness, and it can only improve our standing as a, a, a nation and be, a, be an intentional part of perfecting our union, which is what our constitution calls for when it says we the people. Thank you. And I'll plug, tune in to Almanac this week to learn much more about Senator Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Bill Werner at Minnesota News Network has a question. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope that you can all hear me now. I think I'm unmuted, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. You have a very comprehensive list here. Um, one of the things that I, I did not see on it, but I would bet is on your minds, is the all the issues arising from George Floyd and things that, uh, that were done, but that I know that, uh, that some lawmakers believe have been left undone as well. Are those things on your mind? What do you think is, is realistically that, that can be, is realistic to do this legislative session, given that we're gonna be for part of this session in right in the middle of one of the officer's trials? Is there anyone specifically that would like to respond to that question around George Floyd? Oh, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. This is Representative Frazier. Yeah, I, I, I'm on the uh, Public Safety Police Reform Committee. These things are, are absolutely on our minds. Uh, it, it wasn't that long ago. Um, as you stated, Mr. Warner, the, the trial is coming up very quickly now. Um, so we, we, have worked, we continue to have this conversation in the Public Safety Committee around reform, um, but not only looking at uh, particularly to the metro area, but looking around greater Minnesota and how reform is needed and how there are issues around this state impacting all of our residents in regards to law enforcement and the accountability that needs to happen when issues come up. Uh, most recently, I introduced a, a bill to deal with, uh, with anti-white supremacy to give, the, give our post board, our licensing board in law enforcement, the ability to take action against officers that are associated with um, or supporting white supremacist groups or affiliated with white supremacist groups. So we're absolutely taking uh, these issues seriously. We're continuing to focus in on them and we, we're going to continue to push forward um, as we move through this session. There was... Uh... There were a couple of measures that were passed, including warrior training and, and some of those items, but does there need to be a more extensive examination of police use of force policies uh, and, and other issues? And is that something that, that you as members of the United Black Legislative Caucus um, uh, would be pushing for in this 2021 legislative session? Is it, pra is it politically practical to do it uh, also is another question. Well, Mr. Warner, I would like to say that um, we are steadfast on holding police accountable when bad police officers show up and, and um, you know, use excessive force, that they are held accountable to those actions. And so there is still an extension of conversation and, and moving around legislation that we feel needs to be in place um, when, uh, um, what happened to George Floyd, and, or to ensure that what happened to George Floyd 
doesn't happen again. You know, we, you know, Representative Frazier talked about his bill around white supremacists, but you know, policing in America has a, a long history. And so um, it is a priority of this Black caucus because we have, we know that disproportionately it is Black men, you know, but also women and, and our children sometimes who are definitely uh, disproportionately in, have these encounters with police officers where excessive force is used. So we're gonna to continue to build on the legislation that we moved in special session around police accountability. Um, that is Im Im important and is paramount. And when, you know, when we have police officer who, you know, do bad things in the case of George Floyd, you know, they make, you know, the system of policing look bad. And so, um, and not only do they make the, the system of policing look bad, but they also, you know, um, make it not, we are not able to trust a system that's supposed to be there to serve and protect all of us. So we will continue to look at, you know, holding officers and, and law enforcement accountable for um, those bad actors that show up in our communities across the state of Minnesota. Thank you very much for letting me pull the topic just a bit beyond your, your list. Uh, and I appreciate that, but I, I know that it's an important thing. So, uh, so thank you very much. We have a question from John Croman at CARE 11 directed to Senator Champion. Uh, what are the odds the Senate will give a hearing to the rental assistance voucher bill, the companion to Representative Howard's bill in the House? Uh, thank you for that question. Well, um, I, uh, I would say that I don't think it's uh, uh, going to get a hearing. That, that would be unfortunate. I hope that they prove me wrong. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because we haven't had uh, in the Senate a very positive environment around workers and people and making sure that we demonstrate care and understanding and putting responsible policies and making responsible investments in order to make sure our uh, folks are safe and they're stable. Uh, and that they're able to eat and they're able to do all the things that we believe to be important around workers. Uh, and so uh, I'm sorry to say, and I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I really hope I'm wrong, uh, but I don't think that it's going to get a hearing like so many other bills, right? When you think in terms of some of the other things that we believe to be very important that the house is pushing over to the Senate around some other public safety measures around some job and economic growth measures see the resistance that we're even getting for investments around um, uh, businesses affected by the civil unrest. Um, we believe that that's important in order to make those investments. And, but there's been a resistance to it. The only uh, support, uh, not even support, the only conversation that's been held around uh, whether to put forth the resources for these businesses affected by the civil unrest has been um, a bill that says that any uh, one that's been affected by civil unrest cannot use the natural disaster fund in order to help these businesses. And that tells you a lot about, uh, unfortunately, the state of the Senate. So I hope things change. I hope that I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, if I were a betting man, I would hope that you would size your money up with me because I think I'm right, unfortunately. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so um, if there are no other questions, I would like to just end by saying this, is that as lawmakers, we before you are lawmakers, and we believe as lawmakers that this is an opportunity for us in the House and in the Senate to work to create more fair and equitable solutions and value the voices and experience and the expertise that comes from Black legislators about how we can begin to reduce and eliminate the disparities, the Black disparities that has inundated a conversation about who we are as Minnesotans. And so it is incumbent upon our Republican colleagues in the Senate, because they are the majority, to hear us, validate us, and move our state forward with investment that has historically been left out of the system. There was laws and policies, as you know, that were created that kept our community in a place. Laws and policies. And so it's going to take laws, policies, and investments 
to move our community to a different place. And so that is what our legislative agenda is about. Um, this is why we put it forward. And we hope that, um, that being the only divided legislature in the country, that we find a way to negotiate in good faith about all of us and not just some of us. So I just wanna thank you all for being here today. Um, we appreciate it. Representative Moran, we actually did get well, just one more question just in the nick of time there from Chris Megan over at the Pioneer Press. Uh, Minnesota Department of Health says state law hinders their ability to collect data about vaccinations by race and ethnicity. Uh, should that law be modified and would the caucus members encourage the department to release whatever voluntary information they can collect? I think that's probably a collective yes from all of us. Absolutely. We need to track who's been vaccinated and more importantly, who is not. Yes. So that's something that maybe we can go ahead, Representative Noor. I think that's an important question. I know that uh, the black community was disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and we're also seeing in the vaccination. So uh, I have uh, requested the data because there was a data collected based on the lottery. So if we can get that data, it will inform us where the gaps exist. And I'm hoping that we can modify the legislation to ensure that there's equity in our healthcare system. And so that we can be able to help and close the gaps in healthcare in our state. Is there any other questions? With that, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Bye.